Uh, hi, I'm What If Altist, and this is part of my new series uh, where I talk to fellow alternate historians and we talk about the cliches and the points of departure of several popular alternate histories. I'm here today with Monsieur Z and Alternate History Luxembourg, and we're going to talk about the cliches and the points of departure for World War II. And we're going to start this discussion, which we're going to have a debate in which three minutes we're going to talk about our personal best points of departures to get the Nazis to win World War II. Then after that, we're going to debate over those points, and then we're just going to talk about our least favorite cliches in the genre, and in general, how we think of the world in which the Nazis had won would have played out. Excellent introduction. So, who goes first? Who's the, uh... So, Monsieur Z, uh, you should maybe also introduce yourself to the viewers of What If Altist. Yeah, I'm What If Altist, the one with the beautiful, crisp voice. <laughs> Well, hi everybody. I'm Mr. Z. You can uh, I I make alternate history videos too. I'm I'm the uh, mass marketer. I can put a whole bunch of videos out in one week. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm alternate history Luxembourg, and I'm also apparently joining the discussion. So I also make alternate history videos. Maybe not so much as Mr. Z, who is much more productive. But, uh, yeah, I just try to find uh, fun in all those videos. <laughs> By the way, both guys, uh, the link to both of your videos are in the description to this video. Ah, terrific. Excellent. Um, now, we were supposed to be joined by Frenomythic, who might be joining us somewhere, somewhere through this discussion. So, if he pops up, then all the better. So, yeah, don't be surprised. You know, we, can still have the, we can still have the conversation between us three. Okay. So, I will try to mediate a little bit. And the first question that we are going to discuss is, of course, a general answer to what if Germany won World War II. So, what I think, for instance, might be that, of course, Europe would much be much more different. And, of course, it would have a lot of political implications. And I'm sure one of you guys would have a very precise answer to it. So maybe what if Altist you should go for the first round and then later Monsieur Z you should do the second round. So you want well, I, oh, I think before we start we I should mention that uh, both what if Altist and I are over in the US and you happen to be a European so we'd like to sort of hear your um we feel like you might have a little, um, uh, you might have some different insight onto the implications, say, especially in Luxembourg, considering you're sort of right there, you're like near Germany, near France, sort of where it all went down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so okay, I can, get that I can, if you prefer to give then a bit uh, a deeper perspective into it. So, Absolutely. okay. So, uh, I would say that the first implication, of course, would be that some countries would disappear. Luxembourg, of course, would be annexed, since racially it was seen as Germanic territory. The same could be said, of course, for Austria and also a vast amount of Polish territories at those times. Uh, they were seen to be Germanized, so... Uh, they would, of course, fall under the category of being German. Uh, for the Slavic population, they would actually at first have the same status almost as the black slaves in the US. So maybe that's a good uh, image that uh, some people can um, try to make a link with. But it could actually even be worse considering that you had really strong extremists with the racial policies who wanted to exterminate all the Slavic untermenschen, subhumans as they called them. Of course, some elements would be kept, like the blondie, blue eyes, or the ones who were determined to be Germanic. Uh, yeah, I say it in a very uh, special tone because... Some of them were actually not at all Germanic, but they were in OTL seen as Germanic. So you would have a really huge uh, shift of population in Eastern Europe. And you would also have 
some kind of shift politically in Western Europe, especially in France. France is usually seen as a nation of uh, la grandeur, of splendid, of uh, splendid uh, greatness. But since they were beaten by the Nazis and they would be under their boots, kind of like some bootlickers, as was Vichy France, they would have some, yeah, at first I would say some complexes because they could probably not stand to be just vassals, but maybe at the end they would just accept the German superiority or maybe not which could then imp implicate some cold war between the Vichy France and Germany. And then, of course, with Italy, you could have the same thing as Mussolini was kind of, you know, his own guy, his own man who wanted to do his own stuff. But Hitler always told him to do this and that. So this new Europe would not be a Europe of... Uh, a single uh, opinion, but it would be a Europe very divided, just dominated by Germany, of course. All right. So, guys, are we keeping the structure of starting with the uh, cliche, starting with the uh, points of departure and then moving on to their stuff, or are we just free for all? Then? Just a general answer to what if Germany won World War Two? So, uh, I disagree with some of that. I think that uh, realistically, the extermination of the Slavs wouldn't have really gone down because, realistically, Hitler was the only one that really wanted to do it, and the vast majority of German interests, I think, would want to insert the Slavs and use them as labor, kind of like how the blacks were in South Africa with the apartheid system. And um, I think that North France would have been added back to Vichy France to recreate a puppet state after the threat of a British invasion would have been gone. Uh, hello? Yeah. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so okay. yeah, sorry. <laughs> you still continuing? Because I didn't hear you. Oh, okay. Um, so, do you want me to keep talking? or? Yeah, I mean, uh, I well, think yeah, the connection... On, aside from the from Slavic, uh, you know... Oh, there being no Slavic extermination, what else would you... Sorry, go ahead. What else would you assume from a German victory? Oh, okay. So it depends on what you have. So the Germans could have either won the war by knocking out Russia in the east or knocking out Britain in the west. They kind of get very different conclusions drawn from either of those. If they knock out Britain in the west, they'd end up colonizing Africa. And so you'd probably expect to see Germans retaking their old World War One era colonies, like uh, Taganikia and Cameroon, or probably the same time annexing the uh, Belgian Congo, and, and uh, thus connecting their Central African regions. Also, you'd probably see Scotland breaking off from Britain, as well as um, you'd see the greater alliance off France and more of a competition against uh, the U.S. and Ireland, which would uh, likely move more into the U.S. area of influence due to the strong cultural connection with the U.S., and, you'd probably see a Berlin Wall between North and South Ireland. Meanwhile, if the Germans were to win in the East, you would see colonization of Eastern Europe, while at the same time the competition would be against the U.S. over the English Channel, in which Britain would remain a U.S. ally and satellite, while colonization of the East would take place. Now, when you say... Um you say that there's the two options of either completing the war in the West or completing the war in the East. However, overall, the the typical idea is that the plan is to conquer the East because the East is rich in resources. The East isn't overwhelmingly Aryan. The uh, the conflict in the West, from what I know, it was overwhelmingly seen as an unnecessary war, as a side effect of the invasion of Poland and not part of Hitler's intention. Yeah, but realistically, intentions and reality are oftentimes very different. We could have seen a world in which the uh, Germans won the Battle of the Atlantic but lost in Russia and would have ended up taking over the West while fighting the Russians to a standstill in the East. That's, these are actually very good uh, point of views, and I think they could already uh, lead us to our next question. What's your optimal point of divergence in such a scenario? So, um, if I may start, I would say that probably the best bet 
in my point of view is that Germany is not launching the plan of uh, Barbarossa, Operation Barbarossa. Uh, yeah, there are now speculations that Stalin could also move troops to attack Germany first. But I think that in this state as he was with his troops and all of that, he would have waited that the Brits or the US would make a first move because the uh, explanation in communism says that it's better to wait first until the capitalistic superpowers destroy themselves and that after that, you as a communist power, you just steamroll them. But... As we see Germany in 1941, 1942, even 1943, they were actually really strong. So it would take a lot of power to uh, overrule them, of course. So without a clear uh, casus belli, let's say, it would be kind of difficult for Stalin to break the, uh, the um, pact that Germany and the USSR had. And also it would make him look like the bad guy in such a case. So it would also depend. I mean, in such a case, he would also not have maybe, we don't know, but maybe the support of the US. Maybe there would never be the uh, rent lease, I think it's called. So it would actually cost him some popularity. And I think in this point of divergence with such implications as I think the world would have a four-sided Cold War with the US or the Allies, let's say, Germany, the Soviet Union and Japan. But that's only my optimal point of divergence that I think of. So what do you think, guys? What if all this? Give it a shot. Go ahead. I've actually made a video on that subject and I had Hitler invade Britain and then uh, Stalin attacks from the east as Hitler becomes embroiled in fighting the British Isles. But like that um, Operation Sea Lion? Yeah, yeah. And which I know is a hot button issue, but I in general said that if the Germans could gain control over the English Channel, they could gain naval control and land a force capable of at least holding down England. And Good. yeah. And uh, my personal point of departure is actually having Japan not in. Having Japan invade Russia instead of uh, having uh, them go south against America, this doesn't bring America into the war, and it creates a two-sided war in Russia, in which the Russians have to fight against the Japanese in the east and the Germans in the west. Meaning I always wondered why that wasn't uh, considered for a you know a significant plan of attack after Barbarossa. I, I, I again have a video on that subject, and actually it was because they... Uh, fought against the Russians in a couple of skirmishes before the war, like at Kalk and Gaul, and they lost those. And, uh, yeah, that do it have was a bad in history, uh, Manchuria, I think, Russia no? These wars. It yeah. happened in Manchuria, no? Uh, yeah, Manchuria, Mongolia. Yeah. Okay, um, Monsieur Z, what do you think is the optimal point of divergence? My optimal point of divergence would be no invasion of Poland. It would have to be a very gradual process of Germany gaining more land. Appeasement was working with Neville Chamberlain. If Hitler could find a way to gain more allies and gain more territory without bringing France and Britain into the war necessarily, he would have had a good chance of defeating the Soviet Union and never having to start a conflict with the Western powers. But I mean, realistically, what would that have looked like? He couldn't have headed north. He couldn't have... If he went east against Poland, that would have pissed off the Western powers. If he went west, that would have been a war with the west. The south, the mountains, I mean, what direction? Well, I'd say the idea would be not through, not necessarily through conquest, but through perhaps uh, diplomatic, through ex diplomatic expansion, possibly supporting Mosley in Britain or uh, uh, po uh, nationalist socialist supporters in Sweden and Norway. Just gaining more and more support, so if, should he enter into conflict with the Soviet Union, he's not fighting a war on two sides. He now has potential backing from the rest of Europe. But then you also have to think that when Hitler has allies, 
in uh, such countries, maybe they don't follow for real his own ideology, which would also implicate that he would not have the real support to um, stand a fight against the Soviet Union. So it's a very double-edged sword. I mean, of course, he could have uh, allies who sent him divisions and some support, but I don't think that it could make a real difference, which is my opinion in such a case. I mean, we have the same thing happening uh, with uh, Franco in Spain, for instance. The Nazis and the fascists supported him, but he uh, did, I mean, Franco, he did not give back the same of, amount of uh, support to uh, Hitler and uh, Mussolini. So it could actually even fail, I think. Well, from what, what I, from what I understand, Franco did support Germany in as much as he could without officially entering the war, much as like the U.S. was prior to Pearl Harbor with its allies. But what I'm saying is with the rise of, say, um, nationalism in other nations, so does, the, uh, uh, so does rise the opposition to communism. And here's this massive growing communistic force in the East – it would begin to become the boogeyman of Europe and these nations would have to realize, okay, here's Germany as sort of our buffer country. If something goes wrong there, we are going to be in trouble. Also, I realist- have... Sorry. Oh, realistically also, there were only six countries that really mattered during World War II. I apologize to all the little countries here. But <laughs> Bulgaria is going to project an army into Turkey. There's no way Thailand is going to end up invading French and China. And so even a coalition of a lot of little countries isn't going to make up for a big one like the US or Russia or Japan. And you also have this uh, other fact that actually the Soviet Union was not really considered a boogeyman, but they had very good relations with Czechoslovakia, which was actually the only democratic country in so-called Eastern Europe. Which is also kind of weird, but it's a fact. Let's just briefly appreciate how sad that fact is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it could have worked out like this too, but, uh, well, we all have our own opinions, so we should always feel free, free to disagree. And um, actually, guys, I mean, with uh, such scenarios and this what-if alternate histories that we make... There are some common mistakes that also happen, or clichés, as we also like to call them. I love that word. (laughs) So, um, what do you guys think are actually bad mistakes that happen in such a scenario? So, one for me is just having the Germans conquer everything west of the Urals. This is really common. I mean, European Russia is just so enormous that I I can get the Germans conquering everything to the Volga, but just... The extra step to the Urals is so enormous that it just seems kind of unlikely. Fair enough, but in some of the, uh, some of the scenarios I've seen, usually that's uh, it becomes its own state or it becomes a uh, territory of a different Axis power. It varies because I've seen a lot of scenarios. I've seen not I've seen a few scenarios where that's happened, and they vary significantly. Yeah, but I mean, there's no way Italy is going to hold down all of the Caucasus, or, like, Bulgaria is going to control, all of, like, Ukraine, so... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that I can That see. won't happen, yeah, and I also think one of the worst mistakes is that the Nazis are able to invade all of the US, let's say, by 1947. It just, you know, it's this kind of error that just makes me feel all, you know, just biting my teeth. Because it's not yeah. possible at all. It's like, uh, as you said, uh, what if Altist with um, everything rest of the Urals? It's just not possible. I mean, of course, alternate history has a lot of possibilities, and I'm sure a very talented guy or girl might be able to write a scenario where the Nazis are able to invade all of that. But common sense would tell us that it's not able to do so. And another fact, I mean, another cliche that I don't like is, for instance, where everyone says that 
yeah, all the countries, they will change the flags and have a swastika on it. I mean, <laughs> it's yeah. just this common type of cliche that I see that I, I don't get angry at all, but I just find it hilarious. <laughs> I see it as more of a stylistic thing, like with Man in the High Castle especially. It's really just there to give you the impact of, okay, now the U.S. is under Axis control. Had they just kept the Stars and Stripes, nobody would have really gotten the message. It actually would be interesting to see what an Ari in America's flag would be. Just Would they have like some overly waspy symbol? or I, I'm not even sure. I'm sure there's some concepts out there. You can find lots of, um, lots of multi... I found a anarcho-American flag, which I thought was very interesting. <laughs> it's, it's, it does look like an anarcho-communist flag, but with blue stripes on one side and a big eagle on the red side. And I'm like, oh, that looks fairly cool. I think yeah. as the U.S. is a very proud uh, country they won't rely on, let's say, foreign symbols, but they would try to take symbols that they already have in some way or another and maybe change it stylistically a little bit. And maybe, just in case, I think that the flag would just stay as it is since, in my point of view, as I see it as an European the US flag has a really, really high importance. And if nationalist elements would take power in the US, or even as collaborator, they would, of course, not do any damage to this flag, as it was really, really important. Except, except if the US would, in such a case, renounce to the um, founders of the US which then would open up a lot of uh, ideas, I think. Yeah, that's true. It is. I, um, just like I wouldn't see the flag changing significantly under um, National Socialism, because if you're a nationalist, you do take a lot of pride in you know, your country's history, hence you take, con you take pride in the look of your flag. Exactly. Yeah. So another cliche that I also see is that um, the Axis oh, powers. Sorry, we head over um, the whole invasion of the U.S. thing. That I want, I want to touch upon that. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. In all fairness, in some scenarios, significantly the Man in the High Castle scenario, the invasion is. It's not exactly a mainland invasion done by a you know by the German Navy or anything of that nature. Red Dawn. It, what happens is usually a major U.S. capital either. In Wolfenstein, it's New York. In in Men in the High Castle, it's Washington D.C. One of these uh, places get nuked, and the U.S. is forced to surrender. Similar to Japan, as the Japanese islands were being invaded, but it was going to take a while before a full on, you know, capturing of the islands was going to be possible. Again, realistically, the U.S. is just so big it can trade cities with a foreign country pretty well. Like. If, let's say, the Nazis nuke Detroit, we can nuke Hamburg. If the Nazis nuke Boston, we can nuke Paris, etc. And it could go on for a pretty long while just doing that because both areas are so enormous. And mm -hmm. I think that at the end, the U.S. would even so uh, be victorious in such a really bad scenario where you have the nuclear war. I mean, that would be really bad. So just because of the vast amount of territory that they have, first of all, also, they have uh, territories like Alaska or Hawaii where they could evacuate a lot of people, a lot of scientists and whatnot. And even if Germany actually would hold grip into almost all of Europe, I think that the um, vastness of the US territory would still actually be in uh, favor for the US. Because, look, I mean, Hawaii and Alaska, they are in some way disconnected from the rest of the US and the US is, <laughs> yeah and the rest uh, of the US is actually the only part except for Canada maybe who has access to these territories whereas if you take uh, Germany controlling all of Europe they would have a bigger problem to uh, let's say uh, evacuate a lot of people or just flee into some parts so I think a nuclear war in that case would actually damage uh, the Germans more. 
And then the other cliche that I wanted to uh, talk about is that the Mediterranean is becoming all dry and that it will become like just part of a neo-Roman empire of, well, Italy, which I, I think is a really bad cliche. Funny, that's another cliche that originated from Man in the High Castle. In the book, they it, it's just a lot of these things happen. I'm just noticing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took this down in my Man in the High Castle book review. It just makes no sense. I mean, okay, it would all be salt pans that would be unfarmable. I mean, and also, it would just completely obliterate all trade because so much of trade is water-based. And uh, it would basically, it would take forever. And if you pump it out, where does all the water go? You're going to lose the Amsterdam pretty soon. And um, it's just, yeah, there's no purpose. And also the uh, Sahara des Desert might, might actually expand more into the north, which would then also destroy parts of Europe. And it yeah, would yeah. make more farmlands unsuitable. So yeah. it actually doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah. I would think that if you want to have Uh, bigger farmlands they should just try to take the same idea as it was used in uh, Libya under Gaddafi where he made this round fields where you had like water in it and all kinds of stuff and in there you actually had uh, a good system of uh, plantation so maybe that's one thing that the Italians could then implement in let's say Libya and all of the Zahara together with the Germans or the French. And that could, in my point, make much more sense than making all of the Mediterranean dry. So, Or you could just kill the natives in Africa. You know, people often forget how small Africa's population was at the time. Like Kenya had a population of 1.5 million. So they could have used, put a lot of German settlers in like Tanzania or the Congo and gotten a lot more farmland that way before Africa's population grew. But then you would also have this other problem of the workforce and labor force in general. I mean, the Germans or Aryans, they should not do dirty work, you know. So who would actually do all the dirty work? So, yeah, yeah you might kill off some of the natives. And which, by the way, I would never, never support. But, uh, of course, you could have both uh, sides who would have in one period or another the power, let's say first side would say, let's kill all the natives, but then they would realize what about the labor force and they and then they would probably slow down on it. But yeah. the, the solution to that is um, similar to what happened in uh, Germany with the labor camps. You know, they just work them into death. So Yeah, but yeah, what happens like, after 20 years? What happens... Do a... Go ahead. Yeah. You could just do apartheid where uh, you use the native African labor force and have the uh, the whites own the land. But would this just be based in Africa or worldwide or just in some parts of Africa that would be seen as not fit for white population or Aryanism? Yeah. It would actually probably be a similar model to Eastern Europe with the Slavs. Okay, yeah, that would actually make sense in such a case, yeah. But would the Germans implement this or the Italians? Or would it look like that the Italians are forced to implement it because the Germans wanted it? Or how would it look like? What do you think? I, I can't tell you. <laughs> After the German... Okay, so assuming that the West uh, Desert Campaign and the North African Campaign go, you know, well... Uh, it would be, it's likely Germany would claim the, basically the exterior, m the majority exterior of Africa, while Italy gets the interior portions, those more hostile parts that aren't really suitable to, you know, Aryan colonization. Yeah. Okay. I, have, I always have the Germans take their old colonies and just take the Congo to bridge them. Yeah, that would make sense because the um, this idea of this uh, bridge in uh, the middle of Africa was something that uh, the Portuguese, for instance, said, and also the Belgians, they considered it un under uh, Leopold II, I think it was. So actually, this idea might make a lot of sense. 
So having yeah. Congo and all of that connected, I would see this happening. And also, um, I don't think that the French would lose all of those colonies that they had, because even they were the um, first part of the Allies, and then later they became uh, Vichy France, the Germans maybe would try to use the um, administration and all the infrastructure that was built by the French to their advantage. And maybe after some years, you would see like a switch of um, not occupation, but how should I say? Um, uh, you have this term of um, where a nation is... Um, administrated, co-administrated, yeah, co-administrated by some powers, like originally it happened to the German colonies, but of course later they became British, but we could see the same process happening to the French colonies, more or less. I mean, realistically there aren't enough Germans to control all of Africa, so they're just going to... Exactly. Uh, they're just going to like subdivided to the previous colonial empires like the British or the Afrikaners or the French. And uh But to know, argue with that, wouldn't I can't really see VG France being all too independent from Germany. I just see it really being as an extension of German authority and being German in all ways except by name. Uh, I mean you'd still have French troops uh, keeping down the uh, Algerians and you'd still have French guys running the trains. And also, if you True. take away all of Algeria, you would actually have Vichy France being much more hostile towards you because Algeria was a really, really integral part of the metropolitan France. It used to be really a core land of the French motherland, as it was called at those times. So taking away Algeria might be a very bad move of the Germans. But taking away colonies which are further away, like, let's say, Mali or Mauritania, would not hurt or damage uh, to the relation between uh, Germany and Vichy France, I think. Well, I'm not referring to um, claiming French territories, still leaving them in the French name. However, Germany essentially having full reign within them. It's still occupied by French settlers. France still has claim to that land officially. But if Germany wants to, Germany can exert its force there. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be kind of like uh, be as in uh, the Communist bloc or the uh, Warsaw Pact, where actually the Soviet Union would have the power, of course, to steamroll all of Poland, Czechoslovakia and so on. But the population would be more hostile towards the Soviet Union. And when you give them, let's say, the idea of a free nation, even if it's not free for real, you can keep them much better under your check. Yeah. An another tool conquerors like using is they, they like having oppressed groups have in turn their own groups to oppress. They feel stronger. It's kind of like the North Irish would oppress this oppress the South Irish, even though they in turn were oppressed by the English, or how like the British would oppress the Sikhs, but the Sikhs and Muslims would oppress the Hindus, or that sort of thing. So yeah. the Germans might just give the Algerians the French, to be oppressed by the French to make the French feel better, and so they won't think of how they're oppressed in turn by the Germans. That might actually also be a possibility, yes. Given that they had uh, very good relations with uh, some Muslim leaders in the Middle East, I could see this happening. And uh, actually, guys, what do you think might be the relation between Germany and other big powers? And how would they interact in such an environment, let's say, with Japan or Australia or Brazil or whatever? Actually, it, it varies incredibly depending on what our scenario is. Do we have Mosley in power? Do we have a Brit uh, Britain under Churchill that just surrendered? Is Australia... Does Australia get taken over by the Japanese? It's really a, uh, a matter of what's the ge uh, geopolitical situation. Yeah. I mean, we it's... just go from the fact that Germany is really the only OP power in uh, Europe. And 
let's say the other forces are relatively untouched. Maybe you have some governmental changes, but as for the rest, how could it look like? In general, I have the U.S. and the Cold War against Germany because it's just the only other really big country left to have to compete against. But, I mean, it's complicated. So if Germany and Russia are kind of, if they're kind of still fighting each other and they kind of have a duality, then the U.S. would get along with Germany because Germany is spent in kind of fighting against the Russians and they're, they're not really a threat to the U.S. And if Britain is still around, still has its empire, it'd probably end up being a U.S. client just because it can't trade with Germany and is reliant off U.S. food supplies and is propped up. And Japan, if they, Japan and Russia, Germany divide up Russia like in the High Castle, they're probably going to have a Cold War, but if Japan just its own power, they're probably going to get along with Germany, but not really have, the, did not really have any dealings with them because they're so far apart. I could actually think that Japan in the first round, they might have, of course, good or cordial relations with Germany. Maybe later on they would have difficulties, but, and this is something we need really, really to consider, Japan actually took a huge chunk of uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the population just exploded in there. So, in the middle of this so-called Cold War, let's say, the Japanese, they would actually not be able to focus a lot on foreign relations as they would be too occupied and too much busy with internal trouble, especially with rebels inside their own uh, Asia, East Asian co-prosperity sphere. That's what I think. So it might all, call, all come down to the Cold War between Germany and the US. And maybe there is also some slight possibility that perhaps Brazil might um, also increase in power. I mean, the US was still very isolationist. And if they did not go to war with Germany, it might change the dynamics or the understanding that we have from uh, South America. So perhaps Brazil would then have a change of policies and all of a sudden have a better economy. Maybe they would have a lot of uh, refugees coming, which could also help them. So perhaps Brazil could also be a strong player. But I, I, it might all, call, all come down to uh, Germany versus the US. I, I think it depends a lot on the scenario, but I don't think Brazil would be dominant because, I mean, I think Brazil had huge potential, potential as a superpower, but it kind of spent it by never industrializing. And uh, I think that the time for it to become a superpower wouldn't really be in the 40s, it would be in the 19th century. And I think just as an agricultural nation, Brazil didn't really have a chance as a superpower. But then again, you have also the Soviet Union who industrialized incredibly under Stalin and under huge war efforts within some years. So maybe the same could apply to Brazil, of course, without a war. But let's say they would see the national independence endangered by foreign interests, by the US, by the Nazis which would actually force them to do something about it. I mean, we also have to think that the countries, they want to stay around and say nothing at all. I mean, they will give some kind of answer and we could actually also see some more militarization going on in the world. Yeah, but really... I... Go ahead. Oh, yes. No, go ahead. Oh, I realistically don't think there would be the impetus to industrialize it. I think that's a very interesting timeline. I just don't see kind of the, I don't see the connection, like the jump, like the way I design my alternate history is kind of like one thing touches another, what touches another, I just don't see the events touching off to hit South America. Well, yeah, uh, jumping off of that, I was going to say we're neglecting some, signif uh, some significant things, the uh, communism, uh, the right, you know, the rise of communism in China and the nationalism, uh, the Nationalist Party and the Communist Party in China, Japan's expansion to China, where are all the communists from the Soviet Union going to go? Could something possibly emerge within Mongolia with Soviets migrating south and the Chinese communists migrating north? There's a lot that exists here that I feel 
would set off a different chain of events and leave us with um, a much different scenario. Because I can't really see Britain remaining too similar, the U.S. remaining too similar. Nations would definitely want to either protect themselves or form alliances with this new leader of the European uh, of the European power. I really can't see Mongolia being a superpower just because it doesn't have a high enough population. It's just landscape is too bad to support a higher one. So. Um, well, I, that's not necessarily what I'm referring to, but I was just saying I... Um, well, a convergence of the of Soviets fleeing from Russia and China's uh, Chinese communists fleeing upward. So you just have them meeting somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I, I mean there is a very high possibility that we will see uh, people being displaced, whether by force or not. And I think there will also be another important change especially in uh, other continents. Uh, look, I mean, in our timeline, communism was very often seen as movement of freedom. But if we take communism out, actually national socialism might be seen as this movement of freedom. So maybe, for instance, the Cuban revolution could be a national socialist revolution. Yeah, that's interesting. I think you'd uh, you'd see the U.S. actually allying with the communists against the Soviets and all these areas. Like you might see the U.S. Uh, sorry, the communists instead of the uh, right wing group. So you might have seen the Nazis supporting like the right wing dictatorships in Argentina, while the U.S. supporting the left wing ones in Chile. Oh, guys, I think uh, Frenomythic Productions is coming on. Wait, I will try to reach him. Okay. By the way, can I just talk about a cliche that I had that we weren't able to talk yeah, about Yeah, yeah, earlier? just continue Correct. talking. Yeah. yeah, the Nazis, I, I always find it puzzling that they always give the Nazis such amazing technology. Like men in the high castle, they reach the they reach space really quickly. Um, I've seen timelines where the Nazis have, like, battle stalkers, like, t like t mech machines. I know those are kind of joke timelines, but realistically, we give the Nazis way too good technology for World War II, because if you actually look at the technologies that matter, the Allies actually beat them, with, like radar and the bomb and all that sort of thing. A lot of that is based on, uh, it's, it's really just based on weapons that never came to be. Say we were in a timeline where the Axis won, and we're all, we're all Germans talking about the U.S., We'd be talking about experimental U.S. weapons that never existed, like um, what was it? Like uh, the Arizona Project, or it was a boat that was supposed to be able to turn invisible, and oh. we'd, be, we'd all be talking about how the U.S. managed to do that and changed uh, the tide of the war with it. Yeah, yeah. So, guys, do you think that Nazi Germany would be sustainable for a longer run, or do you think it would actually start to crumble and how? So, I think there's a balance. There's some people who say Nazi Germany would last for a thousand years, and some people who say it would last, would collapse in the late 40s. I think like the 80s and the 90s, simply because the Nazis were so bad to their ethnic groups that as their ethnic groups would start to like, like the Africans or the Middle East, they'd have trouble holding them down. And as the internet would arise, they'd have trouble just without preventing their minorities from like, uh, colluding and passing information on to each other and rebelling. Monsieur Z? Um, long term, I'd say the German Reich would be as sustainable as the British Empire or any empire that came before it would be. When you were talking about the colonization of Africa, uh, one thing that crossed my mind was way down the line if Africa would, you know, these colonies would dec uh, declare their own independence and, you know, begin competing with Germany. It's really the, a recurring pattern. Empires rise, they become the dominating force, they lose steam, and a new empire takes their place. Yeah. I also think about. that the um, this uh, Nazi Germany, let's say, or Nazi empire, would not be sustainable for a very long time. Ideologically, it could be sustainable for a long time because, think of it, 
instead of having communism, national socialism would actually never be that as a political force. So you could have national socialism in almost every country as you have nowadays communism. It would be something very accepted. So I think politically and ideologically, it would never really die out. It would still exist in some way or another. And I think that after some generations, the Germans would realize in one way or another that maybe these policies of extermination and racism and all of that would be wrong, just uh, morally speaking. I mean, you always have these um, changes that are happening, like, for instance, in the US where you had slavery and later on it was outlawed. And of course, the uh, the blacks, they gradually improved in uh, their rights and also in their conditions that they uh, have. So I guess for Nazi Germany, maybe with the Slavic population, it could be the same. That at the end, perhaps they could be treated as second class citizens, as were the blacks before uh, the civil rights movement. And maybe we could also see a national socialism with a human face. So I refer to the communism or socialism with a human face from Czechoslovakia, which you uh, had under Václav Havel, I think he was called. Or no, he had another name. I forgot his name, but never mind. So I think we would have an uh, evolution in the long run. I mean... Nothing stays as it is. There will always be some changes. And I think I'm kind of optimistic in that way. But I think that National Socialism as such would try to improve. But improve, of course, in a very salty way. I really take it with a grain of salt. And it would actually look more like the uh, communism propagated by Gorbachev at the end. So let's say in the late 80s, you might have a Nazi who is like in charge of the business and all of that, who would then try to um, liberalize a lot of things. And I guess when you start to liberal liberalize in the wrong moment, it will all start to collapse. So you will have nationalist movements popping up you will have of course anti-fascists fighting again you will have also within the nazi party a lot of trouble because um, there would be this discussion about who follows hitler's policies or who not was hitler a good guy maybe we would see a de-hitlerization perhaps who knows maybe there would be guys who would say oh my god hitler was an annoying guy he was not showing the true face of national socialism. So you would have a lot of political debates within national socialism, which would actually be almost the same as communism in original timeline. There are two things I'd like to say. And uh, hold on, it seems that Friend of Mythic has joined us. Oh, Friend yes, hello. <laughs> there you are. Hi. Hey. Can you hear me all? Yes. yes. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? All right. Well, <clears throat> well, I am the Frenomythic. I have my little YouTube channel, um, which deals with uh, with alternate history, but also with other speculative stuff like movie psychoanalysis and uh, uh, yeah, stuff like that. Uh, one of my most popular videos is actually the one, the alternate history on, on the, what if uh, the Viking stayed in North America. So, um, but, uh, and uh, I also do some stuff on, on aliens, uh, alien life forms, what on, how life on other planets could have de developed. So it's a very so, interesting uh, channel, guys, so you should definitely check it out. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, You're I checked right. it out so, and it's really nice. So, Phenomythic, yes, yep. we were talking about uh, what if Germany won World War II. We had a very nice discussion so far, but now we want to hear your opinion as well. 
before we go there, there was Wait. something I wanted to touch upon with okay. uh, Luxembourg. Yes. Uh, you mentioned how Germany, well, National Socialism would gradually become more, uh, more liberal, I guess, or more progressive as time went on. Because you compared it to, you know, the slave trade and how slaves gradually got rights and all that throughout our timeline. However, I'd argue against that. I'd say that was more a product of the Enlightenment and humanism during that era. I'd say, since National Socialism dealt a lot more with ethno-identity and cultural, uh, cultural identity, the result would be more a developing of the of within these minorities and these oppressed cultures that they'd go on to form their own nations, their own, where they could be proud of their own backgrounds and they could um, sort of establish a country with their own history under, you know, their own form of national socialism, essentially. Again, there's something I'd like to say in that uh, the big difference between communism and Nazism is that communism could never really fulfill its goods. It always promised to be better than capitalism, but it wasn't able to. Nazism promised to improve the quality of the Aryan race's life by oppressing all the other groups, and that's a pretty achievable goal that the Nazis were able to do. So there would never really be the disillusionment about that because there would never really be a... Uh, Promises would never be broken. But yeah, yeah. then I also have an... I hope then later on we can actually ask Frenomitic uh, Productions about his opinion. But just one thing that I want to add is that if you eliminate the enemy of your ideology, your ideology will start to die off. So if you oppress every group efficiently, your goal, let's say, or your enemy, it won't have a huge impact on the population and you will also start to lose your credibility, your power, and everything will just fall down. That's Competition's true. the motivator. That's true. You can't blame the Jews if you've killed all the Jews. Yeah, so what are you going to do next? I mean, if you blame the blacks and you oppress them already, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense and they are also too far, you know? You need really to take someone who is close. And also that's why my point of divergence, where the Soviet Union still exists, would make a lot of sense because you would still have the communists, you know? It would just be a fight of words like North Korea with the US, but there's never really something happening, I mean, in terms of uh, combat. But okay, I want to now close it in uh, here. And now I want to ask uh, Frenomatic Productions about his general opinion of how the world could look like if Germany won World War II. So what do you think? Yes, <laughs> well, um, well, I kind of jumped into, into the old conversation, so I don't know what everyone else said, but... Um... You have free reign. <sighs> the, the aims, the aims of, of Hitler's Germany were pretty sinister. I assume that we also assume that Hitler survives. Uh, the, the, the war is won and Hitler survives, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <sighs> the, the one thing I, I really start to wonder, I mean, they, were, they had a lot of success in the beginning, but the question is really whether it would be attainable to keep this in this. In, this entire um, region occupied, especially uh, the, you know the, the plains of Russia. Uh, you know, I, I can. They were they were bent on on hell bent on, on exterminating all the Slavic peoples that were in their way, um, with some exceptions, of course. But but in any case, the Russians, the Poles, the the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, and and the Baltic peoples, they were all meant to be either partly assimilated or just destroyed and that is a very sinister uh, world uh, and, and you could imagine that those people would just you know pick out arms and start a guerrilla war uh, and, and with the German army being spread thin all over the place um, I don't think I think they were I, I think it's safe to say that it was <laughs> very unrealistic in, in, in his um, in what he wanted to achieve and how attainable it was. I mean, despite his initial successes, um, it quickly turned out that he had, he, he had built enough oil that he could chew. So even if, 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 if the Russian state was defeated, I think it's, it's, 
there will be a lot of insurgents and a lot of problems with 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 keeping the the area under control and keeping it you know develop it in the way that he foresaw. So what do you think has to happen or what do you think is the optimal point of divergence for Germany winning World War II? Optimal for whom? For Germany, of for course. Ger for so Germany. that they can win, yeah. Oh, right. Um... Maybe perhaps yeah. beating the USSR well, or not executing the, Plan Barbarossa or yeah, exactly. invading the, Britain. The big, the big problem was that Hitler was not a very good strategist. And he, he, um, I think if, if, if you could take Hitler out of the picture, that, that would actually be a turning point. But that's, of course, you know, not part of the scenario. Ah, that's the first the one. That's the first <laughs> one. I actually... Okay. I actually don't hear this so much that people say that Hitler actually has to be taken out of the picture and be replaced. That's a very interesting idea. Good one. Yeah. Although realistically, he'd be a lot less ag aggressive and that would have changed the war completely. You never would have seen the invasion of Russia. You never would have... No. Uh, pardon? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't have seen the Northern Baltic Army yeah. stuck in Courland. Uh There's a couple other points I'm forgetting, but it paid off a couple of times being really aggressive just because he got his enemies completely off guard. Yeah. And uh, frenemitic productions, do you think there are some... Just frenemitic. Yeah, okay, Phren frenemitic. Do you think there are some bad cliches or huge mistakes that are done in a scenario like this? And if yes, do you have maybe one example? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I'll, uh, I'll give my, I'll give the word to the next person. I, I, oh, Monsieur Z, maybe give some examples, so maybe you know we get the discussion discussion a bit uh, flowing. <laughs> some examples of uh, what specifically? I mean, of a cliche or a mistake that are done in this scenario. I mean, you really had uh, some good points uh, before. Well, typically the cliches I see would be instead of dropping an A-bomb on Japan, we just invade. Instead of um, instead of darn, wow, I lost I lost my uh, train of thought. <laughs> Having Rommel defeat uh, the British army in Egypt and conquer the entire Middle East and India uh, that occurs usually because people really romanticize Rommel, which you yeah, can't blame him, them for. He, he had he a lot of victories out making him something of an underdog to people which is you know why you sort of root for him but when it comes to Rommel I yeah that is somewhat of a cliche giving him too many victories people say that people say had you put Rommel in uh, had you had him leading the, um, the invasion of Stalingrad they would have won but Rommel himself said had advised Rommel himself had advised against the invasion of Stalingrad, saying it would have been a disaster. Also, he seems kind of more like a small tactics guy to me. Like, I, I'm a board, big board game guy, and there's some board games I play where uh, different commanders roll differently for how many troops they lead, and that just makes me how feel that... And that makes me, reminds me of Rommel, because I feel like he did really well when he had small armies, but when his armies expanded, he did worse. Like, that is true, because the, you know, the bigger the machine, the more complicated it becomes. Yeah. Given, given um, Rommel's history, I'd say that might be characteristic of him, but he has, I forgot what the battle was called, but I do know that he led one significantly large force, and he did pull a victory out of that. Though I'm not sure if that was out of sheer luck or out of skill or a combination of both. Well, I mean, Monstein and uh, like Monstein was a really good like big picture guy. So I don't I don't think removing him would make things better. Yeah, in that sense, I mean, even if they would win uh, in Stalingrad, the fight would still continue. So there would be huge uh, chances of them losing in any other battle. So Stalingrad could just be any other place, I mean. Yeah. You know, uh, Luxembourg, you suggesting that Operation Barbarossa being an optimal point of divergence, just not doing that? Yeah. Um, I hear often that an argument that 
Stalin had initially made plans to do what Germany was going to do, and just he was going to betray uh, the German Soviet non aggression pact and invade the yes. rest of Europe, which is why he initiated Operation Barbarossa. If that's the case, then Operation Barbarossa would have been inevitable, though. I do agree that had Bar- Operation Barbarossa not happened, we likely would have seen support from the Western European powers on the side of Germany to prevent um, the expansion of the Soviet Union. Since the Soviet Union was something of a... It was seen in a very negative light in the UK, from what I know. France, I know that there was good communist support well into World War II. But the and... communists were banned, actually, before... Were they? Yeah. Although, from Stalin's point of view, it would be completely idiotic to invade Germany yeah. because he killed off his top officer. I mean, I mean, he was he just, just had no. He uh, was just not uh, under, uh, ready to do it. Um, hello. Yeah. Hello. Understa- understanding uh, Hitler's ideology, I think it would it was inev- inevitable that they would the Nazis would would invade Russia. Because really, Hitler really saw he really wanted his hands on, on the um, on, on especially the Ukraine for his Lebensraum for the German people. You know the the, the fertile souls of the Ukraine, and and uh, and so uh, from 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 you know understanding Hitler's uh, beliefs and plans for the German people, I, I think Barbarossa would have been un- 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 inevitable. Uh, he would he wanted that land for the for the Germans. That is then yeah, the, yeah. that's the argument I had made uh, during during my initial point of divergence with yeah. uh, Hitler wanting he wanted the Eastern War more than the Western War. The Western War was something of a unnecessary accident in the grand scheme of his plan. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> So then my point of divergence actually is almost Wait. ASB. <laughs> um, yeah, from the mythic. Was it, uh, I, forgot, I forgot his name, but there was, wasn't there a, a secret mission to the British? Um, well, there was this one Nazi uh, k- kingpin that was sent over to Britain. Zilebe. Uh, to kind of negotiate a peace that uh, you know the, ah, the Nazis Rudolf would Hess. leave Western. Yeah, Rudolf Hess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The Nazis would leave Western Europe alone, and then you know, so they could focus on the on the Soviet Union. Uh, and it's a bit it's a bit shrouded in mystery, you know, if, if it was actually considered by the British or if, you know, if it if, was an actual plan. If we're thinking the, Nazis, the same one, yeah. from what I heard, Rudolf Hess had went over there. Uh, toward the end of the war to negotiate um, an overthrow of Hitler, actually, is something I had heard of. Um, he, he would have um, he would have taken over and had neg- would have negotiated peace with Britain. Well, I actually never heard that, but maybe it's true. Who knows? <laughs> I think yeah, it's no. the time of the war we're talking and who it is, because if Churchill never showed up, I think how the facts would have negotiated a uh, peace or in like 1940 it seems really likely but on the gates of berlin probably not yeah i mean when you're yeah. actually almost about to win a war then of course you will push for a final victory but when you have the nazis just across i mean you will feel threatened and then of course you as britain want to preserve uh, what you have i mean there are a lot of interests that they had in the colonies capital so they would probably try to preserve a lot of capital also in France, which the Nazis maybe would allow. So money rules the world. <laughs> yeah. So friend of mythic, um, how do yes. you think would Germany interact in such an environment where they won World War II? What do you think could be the relations between them and other countries? Yeah. The, the, um... That is a very interesting question. You know, they had, of course, they had an alliance with Japan and uh, Italy. Um, they would, in this in this alternate timeline, would there be a, a peace deal with the United States, or what? What would would they have invaded the United States? What What is the idea? I mean, you would can have been, been discussing. You okay. can just have uh, all your idea that right. you like. <laughs> okay. Well, I think 
it would become it would be really hard to try and invade the the United States. So uh, you know the the man in the high castle. I haven't actually seen that show yet. I really want to do it when I got more time for it. But um, it's I'm not I'm not sure how feasible that would be. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say that mm -hmm. the U.S. United States is forced to to accept Nazi Germany winning in in in, in Europe. Northern Africa. We talked about this earlier and we came to the conclusion that the conquest yeah. of the U.S. is kind of ASB. Alien space bat. The, the conquest of what? The conquest of the U.S. is kind of alien space bats and yeah. uh, unlikely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then um, I think... Yeah. So, you, so I, yeah. I, I, actually Sorry. I'm thinking of... Uh, of uh, I was really wondering about which, which side South Africa would be taking. I mean, there were of course allied... With, with the West, but if the Germans would have won, they were actually, you know, the the, the uh, what would later become the apartheid regime would ideologically align themselves more with with the Nazis in some ways, except that you know the the the, the white minority government would be still you know, in their own way democratic, although democratic only with regards to the white people of South Africa, and and uh, in that respect different from from the nazis that were not certainly not democratic but you know in other you know in other fields that would actually maybe ally themselves with um, with with nazi germany and perhaps try to take over some british colonies in africa as well yes uh, that only joined the war by one vote i think or something oh, really? Really? yeah yeah oh yeah. And actually, they uh, took over control of uh, other colonies like Namibia. So I would see this. Oh, yeah, but there was no, there was a UN mandate, as far as I understood. <clears throat> yeah, so they were mandates. They were uh, mandates by name, or, or but wait a minute. Sorry. Uh, they were Ooh. mandates by name, but I mean, of course, yeah. officially they were ruled by South Africa. So I could see this happening that they take uh, other colonies from uh, other countries. I could see this happening. Yeah, uh, yeah there would probably Rhodesia and, and Botswana. And, and yeah, South Africa tried to seize Botswana in the 20s. Yeah. The British wouldn't allow it. So uh, they'd probably end up doing that with Britain, like being conquered by the Nazis. Yeah, yeah. And they would probably also take Rhodesia, uh, what now is Zimbabwe. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that is like scenario. I wonder how the, how the Japanese... They would probably want to take the eastern part of Russia or the Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, and I really wonder if if, if if the Nazis and the Japanese and Imperial Japanese would you know retain friendly relationships, or if, if you know they're gonna get into a, a conflict somehow. Cold War. Yeah. Over <laughs> another world war. Yeah. I mean, how much could they? Well, they had a lot of space to expand into, of course, both empires. So, so, but maybe eventually it would come to a conflicting. Yeah. So, Although do you think? Sorry. Realistic yep. conflict would be so big that it would kind of be dumb on their sides to fight each other. Kind of like both the Soviets and the Americans were both in our Cold War were both so self sufficient they didn't need each other. Yeah. Yeah, but then you, you got proxy wars, so that's always an option. Yeah. yeah, proxy wars would definitely happen in such a timeline, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what about? Yeah, perhaps Africa would be, uh, you know, something contentious. Maybe Japan would want to have their hands on, on parts of Africa, and then they come into conflict with, you know, the Italians and the Germans and the South Africans. Um, I don't know. The but then again, yeah. yeah. The Japanese, no, fairness, the Italian army wouldn't stand much chance against either the Japanese or uh, no, yeah, Germans. Right. The Japanese did want to conquer Madagascar, actually, to control the Indian Ocean. Was that so? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, they kept their army, they kept their navy around Sri Lanka for several months because they were thinking about attacking Madagascar to destroy the, U, uh, the UK's oil supplies. Oh. So, friend of Mythic, do you think that Nazi Germany, in a case where they win World War II, would they be sustainable for a long time, or do you think they would fall apart very soon? Mm. Well, the Soviet Union was sustainable for a long time, so but that fell apart in the 90s. 
but that were also due to pressure from from the United States and other um, other <laughs> developments in, in in Afghanistan. I'm not really sure. Um, it, it, I mean, I don't think it, it is actually sustainable. Um, it was actually a very irrational regime, and, and that would. You know, there were there was a lot of focus on on the men to be you know either productive as farmers or soldiers or workers uh, and and women to be stay you know to, to, to be kept at home and their their scientific record wasn't the best you know they had a lot of these irrational ideas on on, on science so um, of course they were smart enough not to. <laughs> You know, to allow a group of scientists to work on on, uh, on 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 weapons and nuclear bombs and stuff like that, but I don't I don't think I, I really wonder how sustainable uh, um, you know you would eventually get a kind of a kind of um, idiocracy if if you don't have if 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 you're so ideological that that you're you're stilting science you're stilting scientific thought and innovation. And it, it may be a very slow process, but it, it's eventually it, it's it's going to grind down to a halt. If I may interrupt, I think you could make yeah. the idiocracy argument for any nation that you disagree with. Really, even realistically today, you could make um, you could really apply that similar mindset to any given nation that that um, that treats science or education in any way different than any other country. Yeah. I, I mean, think it's really a matter of placing objective knowledge above the above whatever your preferences might be. And I just think that's a difficult thing for nations as a whole to do. I mean, every culture does it on some level, just ignoring some piece of data or like Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Well, that's um, true. It feels like my Person. Yeah, yeah, but it is it is a mixed bag. I mean, in the West, we don't, you know, Western countries or any uh, developed countries, you know, we it is a mixed bag. We do some things right, and other things we don't really listen to this to the science and, and what 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 you've learned so far. So it, it is a mixed bag. But as long as there is, a, you know, some initiative to be to, to be you know to to respect objective science and to be an innovative, you know. But in, in, in such a, 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 how do you call it, an ideological um, uh, Fight? pressure cooker, oh. pressure cooker, let's call it that. I'm, I'm thinking back of, you know, the Islamic world that, that in the early um, Middle Ages, they were, they were kind of I think the most scientific. Uh, right. Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Like an echo chamber? An echo chamber, yeah, that was not the word, a word I was looking for. It's so, guys, I think let's go, let's go with echo chamber. So, guys, I was more thinking of a kind of a pressure cooker, but uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of you know the Islamic world, the Islamic civilization was actually ahead of, of European civilization some uh, in, in the early Middle Ages, but then. Uh, the 12th century kind of went, yeah. yeah. Then it then it started going downhill. You know, people started to become more orthodox in in the in the faith, and it it's it turned out to be not a very sustainable society. There's it was a placement of a a fixed system of knowledge against yeah. uh, well, not against, well, yeah, against, but also above feasible and procedural science, which is meant to adapt and change. There's if you like keep to things unchanging, then you stagnate and you don't really go far. Okay, yeah. uh, guys, guys? It's also the value of freedom, yeah? Yeah, um, I think we should uh, start to, uh, I, I mean, we should um, finish soon. So maybe let's have our last words on the scenario as such. So... Maybe what if Final artists, words. maybe you okay. have a few last words 